When I took a college course in historical geology here in Texas, both of my instructors identified as Christian, but on the first day of class, they said, if you believe in Noah's flood now, you won't by next week. And they proceeded to show substantial geological evidence inconsistent with and contradicting flood models of religiously motivated pseudoscience. Likewise, I asked Wildwood Claire to help me with this video. She's a geologist active in the atheist community. She's made several videos showing how geology disproves the Noachian flood fable, and I'll include those links here. But she referred me to another geologist, Tim Helbel, who identifies as Christian. In one of the recommended sources, Helbel wrote that most of the pioneering natural scientists and geologists of the Renaissance and late modern era, a group which included many pious Christians, expected that their field work would provide evidence of the biblical flood, reflecting a catastrophic event in Earth's history of only thousands of years. However, as they discovered the interrelated dynamic processes of the rock cycle and pieced together Earth's history from the vertical sequence of rock layers around the world, they concluded that the Earth must be older than thousands of years. Furthermore, they couldn't identify a single layer of rock or sediment that fit with the global flood occurring early in human history. By the early 20th century, most leading Christians accepted the great age of the planet Earth. For example, notes in the popular Schofield Reference Bible published in 1909 provided an Old Earth interpretation of Genesis 1. Helbel goes on to explain how creationist pseudoscientists radically rejected modern geology to erroneously attribute every geological formation to a global flood that evidently never happened. But he notes that the overwhelming majority of geologists, including Christian geologists who affirm the authority of the Bible, reject the flood geology narrative. To that, I would add that less than 1% of earth and life scientists give any credence to creationism and that the only people who do cite religious reasons following their childhood indoctrination, not the evidence. Andrew Snelling is a perfect example of that. In 1990, he documented an erosional period of more than 100 million years on a rock formation that he himself determined to be billions of years old. He detailed all the evidence and methods leading to this conclusion and submitted these findings to scientific journals where it would be peer-reviewed. But at the same time, he was also writing articles for the Creation Science Foundation, which would become Answers in Genesis. Therein, he pretended to refute his own current observations, minus the evidence and methodology, of course. In those articles, he said that the earth was only 6,000 years old, simply because he thinks the Bible says so, and he said that nearly everything in geology should somehow be blamed on a global flood. This is because of what he wants to pretend, rather than what he can show to be true. His position is all about make-believe. To work at Answers in Genesis, scientists have to submit a signed copy of their statement of faith, promising to adhere to that and swearing to promote Christianity regardless what the facts are, since their statement of faith also says that they will never accept nor even consider any evidence that proves them wrong. Yes, they really are that openly dishonest. Sincere scientists don't and won't swear to defend any given position no matter what the way Andrew Snelling did. In fact, Science is the antithesis of faith, working exactly opposite of the way religion does. Andrew Snelling cannot defend his position from an evidentiary basis, neither in peer-reviewed publications nor even in a debate format against mainstream geologists. Yet he remains a pitiful example of professional failure that is the very best that creationists can produce in their defense. Seriously. This credulous, disreputable, self-contradicting sellout to imaginary fantasies really is the best they've got. Creationists don't care what the facts are and only assume their conclusions for religious reasons. They're authoritarian. They don't want to know about the data, they just want to hear proclamations from authority. That means that I would have to cite professional geologists in this rebuttal of the flood fable. It doesn't matter what I say. I mean, I, I do have some direct first-hand experience doing paleontology, both in the lab and in the field, but my eyewitness account isn't good enough for those who only respect the credentials of academic authority. So in this video, I will only recite or relay arguments provided by degreed geologists. Fortunately, I'm not limited to one or two defenders of the faith like creationists are. There were a few geologists who volunteered to assist in this endeavor, such that I will have to divide this video into two sections. And even if I keep everything succinct, they'll probably still be longer than the 10 minutes I originally intended. So this video is how geology disproves Noah's flood, and the next video will be how paleontology disproves Noah's flood. 
For the rest of this video, my material comes from former Ken Ham reading creationist Hal Hackett. He has a Master of Science in Geology from Northern Illinois University and says that none of his graduate work in paleoclimatology could have been remotely factual if there had been a worldwide flood. He also has a Bachelor of Science from Wheaton, a Christian college that has taught Old Earth geology continuously since the 1890s. For every one of Andrew Snelling, there are dozens of evangelical Christian geologists just counting Wheaton alumni. The school itself is officially creationist and contains a lot of diverse creationist views, but in the natural sciences department, you suddenly stop finding young earthers. Telling, isn't it? The people in touch with the relevant evidence believe in geologic time. Even in a school where almost 100% of the social network is evangelical Christian. These students do not reject creation science because it's good for their social lives. They do it because the evidence compels them, even when they have their God glasses on. The central claim of flood geology is that billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth provide evidence of a worldwide flood maybe five, ten thousand years ago. It's worth remembering that this is exactly what the scientific community assumed in the 1700s. Since then, geology has emerged and developed into a unified body of understanding based on numerous interdependent fields, which in turn are composed of the hotly debated work of hundreds of thousands of active researchers. And none of that research makes any sense except for how it relates to all the rest. But the young earth creationists who helped start geology didn't know about two things, earth history and plate tectonics. And we'll consider Earth history a little more closely in the next video. For now, we'll just look at tectonics. Creationists today don't have a problem with Pangaea. Pangaea is the shape the Earth took when the dinosaurs arose, and creationists like to use dinosaurs as missionary lizards to evangelize children. There's something like a flood geology consensus between Answers in Genesis and Institute for Creation Research that Pangaea is what the world looked like right up until God hit the reset button. They think that the last 300 million years of continental drift happened all in one year, with more destructive force for coming from tsunamis than from rainfall, and ocean basins deepening to collect all the water at the end. Creationists don't have much problem you know, with the separation of South America and Africa, but they have no idea that East Antarctica and North America were together two billion years previously because they don't have a view of how continental drift brings the continents together naturally every several hundred million years. There were six supercontinents before Pangaea, most of which only saw single-celled life. And the reason why that matters is that for flood tectonics to be true, then either one, 3.5 billion years of tectonics would have to happen all in one year, or two, God skipped the 3.2 billion years and started the cycle at Pangaea. Now, when plate tectonics happens, the ocean crust gets subducted, dragged under the continent crust down into the Earth's mantle. And sometimes we can use geophysical techniques to peek down into the mantle and see remnants of a subducted oceanic plate. It's actually rare to get a good look because they only last so many tens of millions of years. But if flood geology is honest, then the mantle should be full of spent oceanic slabs, all in exactly the same condition. Structural geology is the field of study for how rock bodies behave under the stresses of burial, and it would be largely non-existent with flood tectonics. Solid substances like rocks have to behave differently under different timescales. For a rock to bend, with new crystals forming simultaneously in the free space on the outside of the bend, chemical exchanges have to happen one by one, so it takes a lot of time to accumulate much change. If the chemistry were to happen faster, the rock would be liquid, not solid. If you could compress 300 million years of mass movement into a single year, the deformation would be brittle. You would still need sources of kinetic energy to do all the pushing and pulling, and you would still need physically impossible physical chemistry in order to get the minerals forming in time. And that's before we even think about how destructive this much kinetic energy would be. Whole regions of land would just explode up into the sky, inflicting impact and concussion trauma on every living thing, and certainly filling the atmosphere with dust for years. Real extinction events are nowhere near this high impact. 
It's important to remember that all geologic processes are processes of entropy, dissipating energy left over from the solar nebula. Flood tectonics imagines some of this entropy happening supernaturally quickly, but the physical explanations are connected, and you can't change some of them without affecting the others too. Now let's not forget about the minerals that have to form in mud layers and deformed basement rocks after Noah's flood. One of the most valuable tools in geology is the petrographic microscope. It's an amazingly simple idea. You have a slice of rock thin enough to fire light through, and then you examine each mineral through a microscope. Microscopic slides alone reveal so many details about a rock's origin and history that to think that the whole stratigraphic record came from a single common event only gets more and more absurd. And as we look around the world today, we see all the same kinds of rocks still forming each in their own particular way. Coral reefs take tens of thousands of years to build because they build one generation at a time, and each generation truly needs its time in the sun. Flood geologists don't believe in thousands of years between the creation and the flood, so there's no way they can explain coral reefs without ignoring everything else we know about them. Carbonate muds, like the Solnhofen limestone where Archaeopteryx was found, are from a highly specific, highly stable lagoon environment with the right oxygen content and the right redox conditions. It is hard to imagine what would more completely prevent the formation of carbonate muds than a worldwide flood. The St. Peter sandstone, which forms the primary aquifer for the city of Chicago, was a river delta and or coastal shore environment at the end of a Mississippi-scale river. The sand that this river left here has been eroded at the surface for thousands and millions of years. It is one of the cleanest, purest sandstone formations in North America. Worldwide floods can't make clean, pure sandstones, especially not if there are tectonics happening, too. Only rivers and beaches can do that. Worldwide floods can't make Grand Canyons either. Again, only rivers can do that. We don't see a Grand Canyon draining every continent. Instead, we have rivers eroding in sync with gradual tectonic changes. And this is not to say that we have no idea what a global flood would look like. We actually do. There are some mega flood deposits in eastern Washington state, ripple marks hundreds of meters long. They happened when an ice dam broke at a nearby glacial lake. Strange, then, that such landforms are not typical on every continent. With water catastrophically washing all over the earth from the oceans, surely these mega ripples should mark their progress. Unfortunately for flood geology, mega ripples only happen when glacial lakes break, and mega floods are not broadly responsible for earth's landforms. Geomorphology is an entire division of geology attesting to that. We can even look back into the past and see how geomorphology worked differently before the evolution of rooted plants and trees. Hydrogeology is about groundwater. Groundwater can only move so fast. Just try moving a lot of groundwater quickly. You'll rupture or liquefy the ground you're working with, and that's what hydraulic fracking is. Groundwater is a problem for flood geology because it hasn't all been in the ground at the same time. Not even close. Groundwater is commonly tens of thousands of years old, and some of it will take a few million years to get from point A to point B. It is impossible to speed that up without perforating the conservation of energy. If groundwater had a shared creation event, or even a shared flood event, the geochemical signature would be grandly diverse and completely unmistakable. Groundwater can be dated by radioisotopes like beryllium-10 and carbon-14, which are generated in space-atmospheric interactions, and it is extensively computer-modeled. Creationists who have yet to benefit from scientific computer modeling may not understand the significance of that. Computers basically give us the power to look to the back of the book and check the answers before we turn in our homework. Computer modeling lets us find out if we're missing uh, part of a complicated explanation. And that's why scientists find it helpful where creationists can't. And geochemistry is the application of chemical principles to geologic reality. Ecosystems depend on their specific geochemical equilibrium conditions in too many ways to summarize because reality is complicated. If you have a worldwide flood, you shut off every nutrient cycle. Even if you miraculously saved every living thing on Earth, you'd still need a magic ecological defibrillator just to get the system working again. 
If you mix the geochemistry of the whole Earth's surface, you will instantly kill 99 plus percent of the biomass. You will have an immediate runaway greenhouse effect from all the methane release, and you will have no way to keep oxygen in the atmosphere. Now let's say God takes care of all that. His magic is strong enough, right? He still has to fake a kaleidoscopic variety of evidence to get you to believe what the fable says. If there was a worldwide flood, the salt flats would dot the continental basins, most of which would then be unusable for centuries. Large sections of them would remain unusable, and all of them would share geochemical traces. None of them would have natural soil horizons. The biblical authors didn't know that because they didn't know how any of these things work. Different isotopes of the same element share chemical properties but have slightly different physical properties. As a result, different isotopes experience physical changes differently, which means they end up concealed differently in different parts of the Earth's system. We can measure the ratios in different parts of the system and use them to learn about the processes of change. Radioisotope geochemistry gives us numerous independent absolute dating methods for rocks and minerals. Carbon-14 and beryllium-10 are two radioactive isotopes produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. The amount of beryllium-10 will tell you how long ago an Earth's surface has been buried or exposed, and the amount of carbon-14 will tell you how long ago an organism died, if it was within the last 50,000 years or so. Otherwise, there are many other methods of absolute dating that can clock back much further, and scientists use multiple methods to confirm accurate results. Stable isotopes are just as useful. See figure 2 in the attached paper by Zakos et al. 2001. The oxygen isotope ratio in the ocean is set by chemical changes in the freshly spread oceanic crust. This is an equilibrium condition that won't change significantly without a major change in the total amount of mid-ocean spreading. Flood geology is actually the only proposal for that, and stable isotope geochemistry makes it squarely testable. The kind of tectonics envisioned by flood geologists would expose massive amounts of molten mantle directly to ocean water in a geologic instant. This would produce essentially a complete departure in the marine oxygen isotope signal. Zakos et al. present a combined record of oceanic oxygen 16 and 18 and carbon 12 and 13 going back 65 million years. The record comes from summing data from numerous individual cores that overlap in layers in time. Different cores are best dated by different methods, but they are always cross-confirmed either with the other cores or with absolute dates. When their isotope data are averaged together over time, we see some very interesting variations, but nothing like the departure we would expect from flood geology. Polar ice caps contain less heavy oxygen than do most waters, so the growth and collapse of ice sheets has an immediate impact on the oxygen isotope ratios of the remaining ocean. Variations in the delta 18 O curve tend to indicate top-down climatic shifts, while variations in the delta 13 curve, however, indicate sweeping biological changes in the carbon cycle. Such changes are responsive to the climate change indicated by the delta 18 O curve, but they are also connected to changing weather patterns in, as the continents move. Look at the curves in figure two. Where's the flood? For scientists, the best thing that can happen is to improve human understanding. But there's always a price on your head to be collected by whoever can show that you don't know what you're talking about. Frauds have a short life expectancy in science because sooner or later, someone will get famous for correcting them. And honest scientists are not going to throw away or ignore every indication of antiquity just because that's how some pretenders want to interpret fairy tales. So get over that. This is evidently an ancient world.